Praise the Lord from all blessings flow. My name is Sean Henry Scott Sr. Today is 4-11-2023, and we are still observing Passover 2023. We are still observing Passover 2023. I am the visionary and founder of Team Jesus USA, Team Jesus USA Church, Team Jesus International, Witness Wear Ministry, Hand of God. We do a lot. We keep busy for the Lord. And the Bible says, whatever your hands find to do, do it with all thy might. So we thank and praise God for using us to be a city that sits upon a hill that cannot be hid, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to anybody and everybody. And we'll, we're going to be speaking on what the Lord has given me concerning that we're still observing the Passover. Um, in today's world, uh, they have their version of Passover or what they call Easter and they do it and they're done but according to my Bible Passover is a seven day depending on the sun and the, and the, there's a seven day, eight day feast so if you ever need to get contact my ministry feel free to call us at 614-847-2057 just don't do it during the broadcast because we use our devices to record or at www.teamjesususa.com and we will get back to you as soon as humanly possible. Um, once again, we're talking, we're still observing the Passover. Let us pray heavily, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank and praise you that you've given us a mind, Father God, to, to serve you, Lord Jesus. There are things that, that you have allowed to be written in your word, Father God, basic instructions before leaving the earth that we are to follow. These wasn't suggestions that you gave us, Father God, in the Word. You gave us promises, and we get the promises when we operate in your principles. We thank and praise you, Father God, that you had took time to give us what we need to survive and live and be overcomers and victorious in this life that we're living. We give you all the praise, we give you all the honor, and we give you all the glory, and we thank you, Father God. Now, a lot of words in my mouth and meditation, my heart be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray for now and forever. Hallelujah and amen. So we're still observing Passover, which is from the 5th to the 13th, and today's 11th. So we have two more days to be thinking about and be mindful of the things that God did for us through the Feast of Passover. Today is the 11th, and we, was, we still have a few days to observe the single greatest sacrificial act in human history. That's one thing we need to understand is that Passover, there's no, there's, no, there's no other, there's nothing greater for us to observe than Passover because without the shedding of the blood, there'd be no remission of sins. We would not be saved without Passover, without the feast of Passover. Just like in the, when they put, had to kill the lamb and put the blood on the doorpost and the deaf angel passed over, we would not be redeemed, we would not be saved, we would not be here. Passover is observed this year from the 5th to the 13th, and this is the beginning of the year for us who follow the Bible. It says that right here in Exodus. This wasn't in my notes to read, but I think I read it last week and the week before that, but it's important that we understand what the Lord said in verse 12. I mean, excuse me, chapter 12 and verse 1 of Exodus says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. This shall be the first month of the new year to you. So when you look at God's reckoning of time, this is the first month of a new year to us. Us who? Believers. To whosoever believeth. And at the end of the day, we are dealing with spiritual and the prophetic nature of our God. John 4, 24 says, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We have to be taught, family, how to worship God in spirit and truth. Because we've been taught how to worship God in flesh and lies. Said that to say the Old Testament was a shadow of things to come, a prophetic shadow, which can be found in Colossians 2.17 that says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And Hebrews 10.1 says, for the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, which they offer year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. 
So the Lord gave us a prophetic shadow picture from the Old Testament. He, he had his prophets prophesy the coming Messiah and the things that Jesus would do when he showed up so we would know who he was, is, and is to come. A shadow is a dark area or shape produced by a body coming between rays of light and a surface. So like I said, God gave us a shadow. It says, it says, for the law having a shadow of good things to come. So the law was a shadow of good things to come. And in the Bible in John talks about that light, a light that, that the world can't comprehend. That's why it's so important that we understand and realize that we don't do what the world do. They can't comprehend the things of God. They don't have his spirit. They don't even believe in him. So it is ironic that today's and today some focus only on what is known as the Last Supper. When Jesus clearly said it was the last, talking about the cedar meal, you have those that focus, when they talk about the Passover, they focus on a meal. It's getting more and more prevalent. It's like they go from one extreme to the next extreme. They went from celebrating the pagan version of Passover, which is Easter. Now they're only focusing on the meal, the cedar meal. It's amazing how we humans think. The Passover is more than a meal. It's, it's more than that. That's why it's seven to eight days. And I say seven to eight because it was always depending on the moon. And those same people only observe Passover by eating a meal and on what they call Good Friday and the following Sunday, which is both wrong. There's no way in the world that a person can die on Friday and raise on Sunday and be three days in the tomb. So at some point, family, we need to come to the truth of the word and walk in the truth of the word. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. It's like year by year, and yet we're still talking about this because we're still in the midst of the Passover. The point is the Passover is so much more than a meal or, and or a service or a gathering in a building, which is why it is an eight-day feast, <clears throat> not something that the council of men can change for the convenience of the people or themselves. If you do research on how it got, it went from being an eight-day feast to what they call Easter, Google it, <laughs> and you will find out there was a council led by Constantine that changed Passover to Easter. Now, when did God give man the authority to change anything in his word? Never. Man has never been given the right or authority to change anything that he had wrote in his word. The Passover was established in Exodus chapter 12. Jesus fulfilled it. He didn't destroy the law. He fulfilled it. And the Gospels it helped him understand that I have not come to destroy, destroy, think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. He fulfilled what he allowed them to speak and do as a shadow. So we're going to be in Luke 22. Luke 22, and we're still talking about, we're still observing Passover. And it was unfortunate when I was doing this study that I did some research on other pagan and heathen fests just to, just to, just to look in contrast what the world does. How it is that there are some worldly things that go on where people celebrate um, all kinds of other stuff for weeks at a time that are completely meaningless, not spiritual by nature at all. And then we look at the condition of the world that we live in. I know people who look at the news every single day just to see how much stuff and, and is going on that's negative. But these same people don't understand that we was we are supposed to preach the good news. Talk about Jesus, the good news. And not only that, like I said, Passover is, is the is, is the one feast that we can solidify that 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 made it possible for us to be redeemed. So how can we allow anybody and everybody, anybody to change how we observe and celebrate Jesus? We need to be celebrating literally the Passover every day of our lives because we're redeemed. But for them to, to squash it from an eight day to a one, that's ridiculous. So let's go to uh, Luke chapter 22. Let's bend to the word. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. The chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being one of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how they might betray him unto them. 
And they were glad and, co and covenanted to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him, betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. Specific time, specific place. And he sent Peter, John saying, Go prepare us the Passover that we may eat. It's the cedar meal that people, people focus on. They focus on this part of the Passover. That's what you find people doing today. They, 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 they go eat a meal. <clears throat> Verse 9. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall be a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. I always love how in Scripture that, that God and the person of Jesus gave specific instructions to his disciples. We overlook these things and how they happen sometimes, not realizing just that's just how specific and particular our God is. In verse 11, And you shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? <laughs> I love the fact he says, The master saith unto him. So they go up to this almost strange, this perfect stranger, and said, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will he shall show you a large upper room furnished there make ready. So they go come into the city. Jesus tells them to go to the man who has the pitcher of water and tell him the master. <laughs> Thirteen. And they went and found as he had said unto them and made ready the Passover. So they prepared the things for the meal, which we know today as a cedar meal. 14. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So, there's been some debate, but the Bible, we know that Jesus being 33 years of age or, or around that age, that he had um, <clears throat> observed the Passover all the way up until this point. There are two scriptures that, that reinforce this. Luke 24, excuse me, hold on for a second. Luke 2 and 41. I'm going to turn that real quick. I'm going to show you how it was that Jesus observed the Passover before he became, before he allowed himself to be the Passover lamb. Some might wonder, what did Jesus do before the Last Supper? Well, all the way from a child up, According to scripture, he observed the Passover, which is what we're supposed to do. Luke chapter 2. Man, that's a lot. 2.41 says, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. So, the scriptures let us know that Mary, Joseph, and Jesus went every year to Jerusalem for the peace, feast, excuse me, feast of the Passover. So, without a shadow of any doubt, we understand that Mary, Joseph, and Jesus observe the Passover every year. It's just that this is the year that we're reading about that he was to become the Passover lamb. Years before, he ate the lamb. This year, this particular year, like he told his disciples, that... He, he, he's waited to the, and he desired to have this Passover with them. In 15, he said unto them, with desire, I, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So he made it clear what was going to happen to him at this appointed time. This is stuff that nobody can change. He solidified things in scripture according to his word. That nobody can change. Nobody can go. No council can get together. No board can get together and say, "Hey, let's let's change the Passover from this to that." I, I don't. I really. I have a real problem with we as believers allowing anybody to change how God, what God told us to do in His Word, under any circumstances. I, I could. I, I will have a hard time being part of a fellowship where they change the Word to do what they want to do. Also in John chapter two. Verse 13, 
It says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So that was two places in Scripture where we it was made clear beyond a shadow of any and every doubt that Jesus observed the Passover. Now back to Luke chapter 22, verse 15. He's, and he said unto them, With desire I desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. This was the appointed time that Jesus would become the sacrificial Passover lamb for the world. For I say unto you, I, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, This, take this, and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it. And gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. So that's the memorial and, and what we do when we generally take communion. We do it in remembrance of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. So we do take communion more often than we observe the Passover, obviously. 20, likewise, also the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. So he literally lets you know this is the New Testament in my blood. In other words, he is about to fulfill the law and scriptures so they no longer have to do it the way they used to do it. And he's telling them that right now. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man in whom he is betrayed. So the scripture just let us know and reveal to us, and truly the Son of Man goeth, and it was determined. He said it was determined, meaning it was already set, it was already wrote, it was already prophesied. In Psalms, it reads, and it talks about, the betrayer. It doesn't say Judas by name, but it talks about the betrayer that would betray Jesus. So everything the Lord said or everything he did, he had a prophet prophesy about before he did it. Verse 23 in Luke chapter 22. And he began to inquire among themselves, and they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. So they was examining themselves. Am I going to be the one to betray him? They literally did not know if it was, was they going to do anything wrong to, to betray Jesus. And, and that, that's a good, humble way to approach anything because in this day and time, generally when you talk to believers, they're defensive about the fact that they may or may not have done anything against the Lord. You know, you have more people just want to defend, defend the fact their actions instead of just examining, their, in examining their, themselves to make sure they're in the faith. 24, and there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them in verse 25, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors, but you shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doeth serve. For whether it is greater he that sitteth at me or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at me, but I am among you as he that serveth. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father have appointed unto me, that you may eat, drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on the thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And he said, Lord, said Simon, Simon, behold, Satan desire to have you, but I have, he says, Satan desires to have you, that you may be sifted, you as wheat. And Jesus let him know, but I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. So understand this, this is a very good, good point to understand that when Satan comes after you, he's after your faith. I know a lot of times people will, will get attacked in their health, in their finances, or in their family. And what they, what they don't understand is that Satan wants your faith. He wants you to, to depart from the faith. He wants to break faith between you and the Lord. So that's why he's attacking you. You know, money can be replaced. In, in, the, in Job, we saw that children can be replaced. You know, it sounds harsh, but children can be replaced. A wife, a spouse can be replaced. 
But if you lose faith and, and, and go into eternal damnation, there's nothing you can do to redeem yourself. He says, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brother. Another important point. When you are converted, have people out here that have not been converted trying to strengthen people. One day they're up and one day they're down. You're a bad example of a person walking on the faith because you haven't been converted. 33, and he said unto them, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that, that thou shall thrice deny that thou knowest me. And he said unto them, when I sent you with our person, script, and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said, Nothing. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise a script. He that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you, that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. So much meat, so many nuggets. Look, listen to what he just said. This, that, he says, that this, that is written, you hear that, must yet be accomplished in me. We have Genesis to Malachi as Old Testament books, 39 of them. Everything that was written. Let me go to this scripture real quick. That stopped my notes, but I hear the Spirit. 24. It's important for us to understand what the, what the what the Spirit is saying to us right now. In Luke 24, 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning. So from Genesis actually to Revelation, but we're speaking only from Genesis to Malachi because those were known as the Old Testament books. He spoke of things concerning himself. We are, we are literally being taught Jesus through the scriptures. He says, For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished. So he had prophets. The law was done as a shadow. He had prophets speak concerning the things that he will fulfill concerning the law so that we could be redeemed. I'm trying not to lose anybody. It's, it's not deep, but it's, it's important that we understand the process that God used to save our souls for eternity. When we don't understand these things, we will go for anything. We'll go for everything. We will allow the, this present world to dictate the promises of God, and you cannot do that. In order to receive the promises, you have to operate in God's principles. You cannot get God's promises doing what the world is, is dictating for you to do. Excuse me. 37 again. We're almost there with this set of scriptures. For I say unto you that this that is written, this that is written, and at that particular time it was the Old Testament, must be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. And I want to say this also. I know I'm, I'm really drilling this point, but I want to say this. Don't you realize that the Pharisees, the scribes, and the Sadducees that was used to deliver Jesus to the Romans had the scrolls? They had access to the scrolls. They, they, was, they, was, reading the, they was reading the law. They was reading the prophets. And they, they did not understand who Jesus was. They missed it. They literally missed it and was used to crucify, deliver Jesus to the Romans to be crucified. Which for us, yes, is great because we was redeemed by his blood. But at the same time, Jesus told Pilate that the ones that have delivered me to you has the greater sin. So even though they were used to fulfill scripture that needed to be fulfilled for us to be saved, they still committed a sin in doing that. Hope that didn't fly over your head. But, and I said that to say this, though, they were Jews. They were his brothers. His own brothers did this to him. They did that. The things that they did was used to help us be redeemed. And I'm saying that to say this. There are believers today in 2023 who are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ 
according to the world, not the Bible and not according to Jesus Christ. They're doing it based off of what their eyes see, their ears hear, and not by the spirit of the living God. And he said, For I say unto you in 37 and 22 of Luke, For I say unto you that this that is written must be accomplished in me. Saying this, that everything that God has instructed us and called us to do, to preach and teach, is written. It is all written. We don't never go off script. We don't never just make up what we want to make up and say. We say what's written. That's why I read the scripture. And he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. Verse 38, and they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. It is enough. So we're still observing the Passover. Now I want to speak on the cedar meal for a minute here because, like I said, that's the one thing that people seem to have clinged to. That, 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 that They'll do the cedar meal on... On Good Friday, as they call it that, which is, you can't call it that because it's not a Good Friday. Because the word Friday wasn't... I don't know why, why it's so hard for us to, to say what the Bible said. Jesus didn't name the days. He numbered the days. And I honestly believe if, if we as believers as a whole start doing what the Bible says, everybody else will have to follow suit versus the other way around. So to see the meal, we're going to talk about that when it was first established in Exodus 12. Going back to verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, And this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. That's why this, this time is called spring. I know they say spring forward, fall back. It's called spring for a reason. That's why I love the Lord, because he's so prophetic and, and perfect in his ways. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month, the first month of the year to you which will help people also understand the birth of Jesus Christ when they understand spring. Back to verse 3 in chapter 12. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month shall you take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto the house take it according to the number of souls, of the souls every man according to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill it in the evening. Verse 7. And they shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts, of the upper doors posts of the houses, where they shall eat it. God's given instructions as they got delivered from 430 years of bondage. Verse 8. And they shall eat of the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread. And with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. So this is the part that the, that the modern church follow for whatever reason. They have chosen to make what they call Easter about the cedar meal. And they still call it Easter. And then they still say Good Friday. And they still do Sunday, which is so backwards. Now, verse 9. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with prudence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. And thus shall eat it with your loins girded, shoes on your feet, and with your staff in your hand. And ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. <sighs> Excuse me. Not the Jews' Passover. Not the Hebrews' Passover. It's the Lord's Passover. The body of believers is made up of many different races, genders, male, female, and cultures and colors. It's a huge mistake when people try to put things in a box. We attempt to observe the time and the season and the meal, but what about everything else concerning Passover? It's important that we understand beyond a shadow of any and every doubt 
what Passover is all about. And if we, in our ministry, like I said, we prepare about for the feast, like we're about to start preparing for Pentecost by preaching and teaching on it a month in advance. How, how can uh, the people understand what the Bible says concerning these holy times, these high holy times and appointed times, Moedim, if we don't educate our people on them? You know, I'm almost insulted, insulted when I hear some of the things that people are talking about from the pulpit, from that elevated place. I'm like, what are you talking about? That has nothing to do with Jesus or the word of the living God. In Acts 18, 21, we are reminded, but, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep the feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I would return again unto you, if God will, and he sailed from Ephesians. Talking about the Apostle Paul keeping the Passover. And I'm, I got these scriptures to reinforce and help people understand that even after Jesus allowed them to crucify him and God rose him from the dead, they were still keeping the Passover. In Acts chapter 20, verses 6, it says, And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came into Tros in five days where we abode seven days for the Passover. That's what they did. They, they, they did what they were taught to do. And generally, that's what people will do. If we taught people to observe the Passover the way the Bible said do it, what do you think they're going to do? People, uh, we, we, helped, we, we baptized two folks last week doing outreach. Outside, first time, we bought a, they got a pool out there, a baptismal pool. And they got baptized, so they're, they're new babes in Christ. So whatever we teach them to do according to the word is generally what they're going to do. It's unfortunate that people come into the kingdom and are taught uh, the, the pagan version of things, not the, 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 the scriptural, biblical version of things. So then when you tell them about something and it doesn't line up the word of God, that's confusion. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 through 8 says, Purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I believe the scripture is, is framed that way because you had the same people who was used to crucify Jesus and deliver Jesus to Pilate had kept the, they was keeping the Passover without any understanding of what it was, or else they would not have did, did what they did to Jesus. They broke so many of their own laws when they delivered Jesus to Pilate just so they could have their own way. It's unfortunate, but you can learn a lot from their, their mistakes. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of, of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. That's why the, the Bible warns us, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. 